Thank you all for joining us for today's webcast, KT101, Knowledge Translation Initiatives at CIHR. I'm Ann Williams of CETL in Austin, Texas, and I'll be moderating today's webcast. This webcast is offered through the Center on Knowledge Translation for Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or KTDRR, which is funded by the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research, or NIDR, in the U.S. Department of Education. I want to thank my colleague Joanne Starks for her support in coordinating today's webcast. A reminder that we will ask you to complete a brief evaluation at the end of the webcast today, and I'll give you more instructions following the presentation. And you may download a copy of the presentation from our website at www.ktdrr.org. The Center on KTDRR is working with a number of national and international partners, and one of those is the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, or CIHR. You're probably aware of the fact that CIHR, which is the Government of Canada's Health Research Investment Agency, and was first to define and embrace the term knowledge translation, or KT. We're partnering with CIHR's Knowledge Translation Strategy Unit to learn about the innovative KT strategies they are continuing to develop and implement. This webcast on CIHR's KT initiatives is the first in a series of four webcasts that also include Ethics in KT, KT and Evidence-Informed Policymaking, and Patient Engagement in KT. Today's webcast will provide an overview of the CIHR Knowledge to Action Cycle and the various funding opportunities that have been implemented to advance knowledge translation and lead to improved health through evidence-based practice and care. At CIHR, KT is defined as a dynamic and iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge to improve the health of Canadians provide more effective health services and products and strengthen the health care system. This process takes place within a complex system of interactions between researchers and knowledge users, which may vary in intensity, complexity, and level of engagement depending on the nature of the research and the findings as well as the needs of the particular knowledge user. To this end, CIHR funds a suite of funding opportunities that span the KT spectrum. Joining us today are Drs. Alyssa Schaefer from CIHR and Neil Cashman from the University of British Columbia. Dr. Alyssa Schaefer is currently the Senior Advisor for Knowledge Translation at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. In this capacity, she is focused on analytical measures of knowledge translation and the support of commercialization funding opportunities. Dr. Schaefer received her PhD in 2007 from Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. She was an American Association for the Advancement of Science Policy Fellow at the National Institutes of Health, where she worked on legislative policy, commercialization, and global health matters. Also joining us is Dr. Neil Cashman. He is a professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia, where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Neurodegeneration and Protein Misfolding Diseases. He has authored over 300 publications has an H index of 50, and has more than 10,000 career citations. He was cited by CHR for the medical milestone of, identi of identifying a prion-specific epitope in 2003. He was scientific director slash CEO of PreonNet Canada, one of the network of centers of excellence, and is founder and chief scientific officer of Amorphix Life Sciences since 2005 a company commercializing his therapeutics and diagnostics in protein misfolding. Dr. Cashman's translational approach to neurodegeneration is exemplified by his 45 patent applications he has filed and the successful licensing of novel therapeutics to Amorphix, Biogen IDEC Corporation, CanGene Corporation, the latter company developing his A-beta oligomer-specific antibody for immunotherapy of Alzheimer's disease. Welcome to both of you. Alyssa, are you ready to begin? Yes, I am. Thank you, Anne, very much for that wonderful introduction. Today, I'm going to talk about knowledge translation initiatives at the Canadian Institute of Health Research. And what I'd like to do is provide an overview of CIHR, 
how we define knowledge translation at CIHR and what it entails, our various research support mechanisms, and some online knowledge translation resources that are available. So CIHR is Canada's health research funding agency, which is very similar to the National Institutes of Health in the United States. CIHR is composed of 13 institutes that span the country from the east to the west, such as the Institute of Genetics at McGill University in Montreal, which would be just north of New York, to the Institute of Neuroscience, Mental Health, and Addiction at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, which would be just north of Washington State. Aside from institutes that fund basic biomedical research, we also have institutes that address Canada's health care needs, such as the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research and the Institute of Population and Public Health. CIHR and the institutes support four pillars of health research, including basic biomedical research, clinical research, research around healthcare delivery and policy, and the impact of social, cultural, and environmental factors on health. Unlike the NIH, which supports intramural and extramural research, CIHR only funds extramural research and does not have intramural research facilities. Funding for research can be investigator initiated, Hence, the researcher forms the ideas and sends in an application, or it could meet the need of strategic priorities or gaps in health research and knowledge translation. So in this case, the researcher would apply to a specific funding opportunity. The investigator-driven research comprises about 70% of CIHR's budget. The strategic funding opportunities account for about 30% of CIHR's budget. For example, one of CIHR's major strategic initiatives focuses on patient-oriented research to improve patient outcomes. So what is knowledge translation? How does CIHR support it? And what does it mean to the researcher and the key stakeholders. At CIHR, we define knowledge translation as a dynamic and iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge to improve the health of Canadians, provide more effective health services and products, and strengthen the health care system. In order to achieve this, we expect that researchers engage with key stakeholders that should be part of the research process and that may be impacted by the outcome. So we refer to these key stakeholders that are involved with the research process and outcomes as our knowledge users. For example, if a researcher is looking at developing a drug to treat prostate cancer and she has already shown efficacy in an animal model and is ready to move to clinical testing, this researcher is at the point where she will want to engage some key knowledge users at the appropriate points in time. So she may meet with a biotech company or people at a pharmaceutical firm to assess their interest in developing the compound. So the key stakeholders at the industry side would be considered knowledge users. The patients would also be knowledge users, so she may want to meet with a specific group of patients. These knowledge users should be identified at the point in time when the research project is being designed. So you want to think about your key stakeholders and who your knowledge users are quite early on. So it's not something that comes at the end once the research is done, but something that you're really thinking about and working on as you're designing your project. So the re knowledge users should be identified and included as knowledge users on the research application. 
The research design and engagement of knowledge users is part of what we call integrated knowledge translation. Furthermore, how the research findings will be disseminated at the end of the research project is also an important point that needs to be fleshed out with the knowledge users at the point of the research design. So this is all happening quite early on. But these, the things that happen at the end of the grant are what we deem end of grant knowledge translation. And also the dissemination of findings to the knowledge users, such as publications, clinical guidelines, best practices, and having an impact on healthcare and policy would also fall into the end of grant knowledge translation activity. So we want to be conscientious of what we do in research, uh, the integrated knowledge translation, the end of grant, and who we engage and when. So we want to keep in mind that we want to uh, engage the knowledge user at the appropriate point in time. And when one is working on a project, it's not that we expect the researcher to do everything all along, but it's to do what is appropriate at the right point in time. Um, in order to meet the needs of knowledge translation and researchers, the IHR has several funding mechanisms that support KT across the health research spectrum. I would like to point out, however, that I'm going to be discussing some funding mechanisms that we have used in the past and we plan to fund over the next couple of years. However, we are in the process of streamlining and modernizing our funding mechanisms, and changes to our programs and peer review process are being made. And more of this information can be found on our website. So our KT funding opportunities span the spectrum from basic research, commercialization, and capacity building, as well as planning and dissemination events that could include activities such as engaging with policymakers, patient, patient groups, and not-for-profit organizations. Our planning grants are the preparatory stage of developing a grant proposal where the research team trainees, and knowledge users come together to develop key aspects of the research plan. So it's really a team that we're funding, and we want to see this team come together and work together. For example, there's a CIHR-funded planning grant that is being used to ascertain what aspects need to be assessed to keep older adults in an assisted living environment versus more supportive, more expensive care. In this case, the research team reviewed the literature. They conducted site visits to the assisted living homes and interviewed the staff in order to develop appropriate implementation strategies for an active lifestyle program across the assisted living sites. And so their goal was to keep the older adults in the assisted living homes rather than, and developing a program so that the older adults are active. Um, we also fund dissemination events. Uh, we have funding opportunities support events that contribute to the dissemination and exchange of research evidence. And these dem dissemination events really tie into the end of grant activities. So for example, a CIHR dissemination grant was used to develop a website to inform Canadian patients about ethical issues in medical tourism. So the applicants worked with diverse medical tourism stakeholders and then deemed it was important to disseminate the information about the ethical issues raised by medical tourism. So hence they developed the website. Dissemination events can really span the spectrum of different activities. So it could also entail the education of groups such as patients, health professionals, community organizations, policymakers, and the general public. CIHR supports knowledge synthesis grants that aim to assemble, analyze, and summarize knowledge to inform knowledge users and researchers based on the state of current evidence. So examples would be meta-analyses, practice guidelines, and syntheses. We also have the Knowledge to Action funding opportunities. 
though the intent of the knowledge to action funding opportunities is to accelerate the translation of knowledge by linking researchers and knowledge users to move knowledge into action and in so doing increase the understanding of knowledge application through the process. So for example, through a knowledge to action grant, CII, CIHR supported Rx for Change, which is a searchable database containing current research evidence about intervention strategies used to alter behaviors of health technology prescribing, practice, and use. The intent of this database is to help inform the choice and use of practical, evidence-based interventions. The Partnerships for Health System Improvement is Canada's premier health services and policy research competition with a strong emphasis on partnerships and knowledge translation, it is a major resource for managers and policymakers who want relevant research to inform their decision making. So teams are required to come together and also bring in a minimum of 20% of the amount requested from CIHR from the external partner. And the partners can provide cash or in-kind support or in combination of both. So what I really want to highlight with our, a lot of our knowledge to translation funding opportunities is we're focused on partners, on teams, on collaboration. The IHR also supports, um, we're focused on attracting and retaining the best talent in health research and preparing young researchers for multidisciplinary careers and careers outside of academia. So to meet these criteria, CIHR has several awards that build capacity for promoting knowledge translation. For example, the Science to Business Award encourages individuals with PhDs in the health-related field to pursue an MBA. The Science Policy Fellowship is used to bridge the gap between the world of science and policymaking. CIHR also supports doctoral, fellowship, and new investigator awards. So those are some of the specific knowledge translation mechanisms CIHR supports or has supported. Our open operating grant program is the largest of the open call for proposal, proposals within CIHR's programming to fund health research. So this is really where the researcher sends in a proposal and it's reviewed by different uh, peer review committees. And we can have knowledge translation applications come in through our open operating grant program. The knowledge translation projects are supported through this investigator driven scheme and when appropriate the applications are assigned to a peer review panel that has KT experts on the panel. I want to take a bit of time to talk about our commercialization funding opportunities. CIHR has several commercialization programs that are part of the KT portfolio as commercialization is a key component of knowledge translation. To this end, CIHR offers a suite of commercialization initiatives that encourage the capacity of universities and teaching hospitals to interact with partners responsible for delivering the benefits of health research. Now what I want uh, our audience to keep in mind is that CIHR funds the academic partner through its commercialization program, which is different, for example, than the Small Business Innovation Research and Technology Transfer Program in the U.S. So in the U.S., the SBIR, STTR program, funds the small businesses, whereas in Canada, CIHR is funding the academic researcher. So for example, with the Industry Partner and Collaborative Research Operating Grants, we provide funding for collaborative research projects involving the academic community and the Can uh, Canadian industry partners sharing an interest in health, research, and development. The research, research planned should be benef beneficial to both parties while improving the quality of health of Canadians. And this type of funding opportunities requires one-to-one -one matching funds from the industry partner. And also in the states, often with these SBIR and STTR programs, at different phases of those programs, there may be a requirement for matching funds. So that would be a similarity. Uh, we have a proof of principle 
program which provides grant funding to advance discoveries, inventions towards commercializable technologies with a view to attract, attract new investment, create new science-based businesses, organizations, and initiatives, and improve health outcomes. The end product is not required to generate revenue, uh, but there must be a demonstrated market and opportunity for the product. And I think this is also quite similar to the SBIR, SCTR program in the US, where really uh, the government is funding the entrepreneurship of these small businesses, but is not always looking for that huge return on investment. So we also have a phase two of our proof of principle program, which provides a platform to better enable the academic institutions and researcher to move the discovery further down the innovation pipeline. And it's at phase two and not at phase one, where again, CHR is uh, requesting that there is one-to-one -one matching funds from the non-academic partner. Um, in Canada, we have several funding agencies and in order to tie together uh, some of what we do between the different agencies, we use the Collaborative Health Research Projects Program, which is a joint program with our sister agency, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. This program encourages the NSERC and CIHR research communities to collaborate and integrate their expertise and enhances the training of highly qualified personnel in collaborative and interdisciplinary research. So this would be similar to joint funding between the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation in the US, where you're really looking to take the biomedical side, the engineering side, the different sciences, and break down the silos and bridge the gaps and really encourage multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary research. And I think we're really moving towards that type of um, multidisciplinary research type of model. So in this case, with the CHRP program, Applicants are required to collaborate with a non-academic knowledge or technology user organization from the private sector, the public sector, or even the voluntary sector that could benefit from the research results. And I want to highlight that the next presentation is one of uh, a, is a CIHR awardee whose projects are really stellar examples of moving research uh, from the lab through the commercialization pipeline to really improve the health outcomes uh, for, uh, the, for the population. At this time, I want to take a minute to point out uh, some, of the ever, some, some other resources that we have online uh, on our website. And one that may be most appropriate for, the, for this audience is the Guide to Knowledge Translation Planning at CIHR, the integrated and end of grant approaches. And key components, where key components of integrating KT into research planning and reviewing applications is outlined in this guide. And this document is targeted to applicants, to knowledge users, and also to reviewers. So I definitely recommend that uh, people seek out this guide and take a look at it um, in order to figure out how to really apply uh, for knowledge translation grant and uh, good ways to review it and what is expected of a knowledge user. At this point in time, I will uh, just take a minute to go through some of the other online resources we have, uh, which are listed here on our slides. And then I'd also like to highly encourage the audience to listen to the presentation by Dr. Neil Cashman, who can really showcase the impact on improving lives through effective knowledge translation. Welcome, Dr. Cashman. Are you ready to begin? I am. Um, so here I am on the first slide, uh, protein misfolding diseases, knowledge translation, and new technologies. I just wanted to uh, note for the amusement of the audience that my Canada research chair is in neurodegeneration and protein misfolding diseases. My lovely wife listened to that title and said, well, let's shorten it to your misfolding chair. <laughs> I kind of like that. 
Um, on slide two, I am showing my industrial engagement. And I realize that um, often when industrial uh, connections are, are listed, it's listed in terms of disclosure, like it's something to be a little bit ashamed about or hidden. But in fact, I'm very proud of my industrial interactions, so I call it engagement. I actually founded two biotech companies in Canada, uh, both of which are publicly traded, Caprion Pharmaceuticals and Amorphix Life Sciences. And I've provided um, licensed technology to Biogen IDEC uh, in the Boston area and Cangene Corporation, uh, which is in Winnipeg and has been um, taken over by um, uh, by Emergent Biosolutions, uh, a uh, biotech company in the United States. I also serve on the scientific advisory board of Prothena Biosciences, which is in the Bay Area. So I want to start this talk by really talking about the socioeconomic challenges of neurodegenerative diseases. We all know somebody, and perhaps we have family members who have uh, developed one of these neurodegenerative diseases in late life, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and ALS. We all know how much of a tragic burden they are, not only for the sufferers of the diseases, but their families and communities. What I want to highlight here is something that's more cold-hearted, which is the financial aspects of these diseases. Um, in Canada, Alzheimer's disease costs $15 billion a year, and it'll be 10 times that in a generation. Uh, five and a half million Americans are living with Alzheimer's disease. The statistic I liked to quote is the last um, bullet point, which is, delaying Alzheimer's disease for just five years. This isn't erasing the problem. This is just postponing the problem. But delaying Alzheimer's for five years would save an estimated $50 billion in, animal, in annual health care costs in the United States and $5 billion uh, in Canada. Obviously, there's a huge um, unmet medical need and opportunity here. Parkinson's disease on the next slide um, is less common than uh, Alzheimer's, but certainly common enough. Drug treatment for Parkinson's requires constant adjustment over the course of the disease. Worldwide, the cost of medications alone is $11 billion a year. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a disease I've, I've worked with for 25 years now, it's a progressive motor neuron disease resulting in paralysis of the muscles of the limbs, speech and swallowing, and breathing. It's a relatively rapidly fatal neurodegenerative disease. Um, costs in the US can approach $200,000 a year just for uh, managing ALS, the increasing uh, weakness and uh, inability to swallow and communicate. So obviously there, there are challenges with these diseases um, and, um, and it's up to, up to us to try to figure out how to help people with these diseases. So I'll, I'll turn to the um, next slide dealing with the Canadian Tri-Council mission. Uh, which is knowledge translation and mobilization. You've heard the CIHR definition of knowledge translation. Uh, there's also a, um, a phrase, knowledge mobilization, as defined by our Natural Sciences Council and our Social Sciences Council as specific activities and tools designed to put available knowledge into active service for the benefit of society. Uh, KT and KM are supported by tri-council program competitions, including the ones that you heard uh, Dr. Schaefer talk about, CIHR, RX&D, the University Industry Grants, Proof of Principle, 
and specialized KT programs. I would also point out that there is a uh, marvelous Canadian invention, which is the Networks of Centers of Excellence. And this group can supply, through Tri-Council, uh, CIHR, NSERC, and SHRC, uh, with large grants to address a major socioeconomic problem uh, that requires uh, uh, networking across the country and international collaboration in order to solve. I had the honor of uh, directing one of these uh, networks of centers of excellence called PreonNet Canada. I'll, I'll have a slide a little later on to uh, discuss uh, what, we, what we did in that network. But now I will turn to the science that really informs our work and my laboratory. Um, and I'm going to start with two disruptive ideas. I think we've heard about disruptive technologies, things that overturn accepted practices. But I'm going to present you with two disruptive ideas, uh, which has uh, provided um, an enormous impetus for us to develop uh, new therapeutics and diagnostics. Uh, in high school, we learn that proteins are a chain of individual amino acids encoded in the DNA and RNA, uh, perhaps in high school, perhaps in college or university. We learn that this string of amino acids has no function until it's properly folded into a precise three-dimensional shape. In this precise shape, this chain acquires its function as a sphere, as a rod, or whatever the shape of the protein is. Uh, that used to be the be-all, end-all when a protein gets old, when it becomes oxidized, when it becomes partially misfolded. It's degraded by uh, the protein degradation machinery, including the lysosome, including the proteasome. Oh, dear. So that was advanced. Um, but um, uh, it was with the advent of the prion hypothesis, as formulated by Stanley Prusner back in 1982, that we started to discover that there was a different way that proteins could end up. They could misfold and trigger the misfolding of normally folded native proteins. So when a bad guy comes in contact with a good guy, there's conversion of the good guy into more of the bad guy. And this is the basis of prion infectivity. Prion diseases include Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in humans, mad cow disease, um, our bovine spongiform encephalopathy, and uh, also a disease that's running rampant in the wild, uh, which is chronic wasting disease of deer and elk. So um, over the past 10 years, though, it's appeared that many diseases are borrowing from the prion playbook, so to speak, uh, that um, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, ALS, actually have a prion-like mechanism behind them, the propagation of protein misfolding. So we'll go into that a little bit uh, deeper in the next slide. Uh, up in the upper right-hand corner uh, is a new hypothesis that we're approaching that not all protein misfolding has to be uh, permanent and irreversible. Uh, there can be some protein misfolding which is local, which involves only a small region of a protein, uh, and also dynamic, converting back and forth between a normal shape and an unfolded shape, uh, this particular idea is finding application in the treatment of cancer while sparing normal protein. So we'll move to the next slide. The second disruptive idea is that antibodies can selectively target misfolded proteins while sparing native isoforms. Um, this is um, an important thing to wrap our heads around as a field and as individuals. We've all been kind of trained with the idea that 
uh, medicinal chemistry is aimed at targeting a specific pit or pocket or cleft uh, in the surface of a, of a protein. It can induce allosteric changes in an enzyme. It can block a channel and whatnot. So this is the basis of, of big pharma up until this point. But misfolded proteins, or even regions of misfolded proteins, are totally different. These are large, floppy regions which are essentially undruggable. There are no pits and pockets. There's this constantly shifting uh, of shape and structure. Um, however, antibodies can be raised uh, that eat things like this for breakfast. A large, uh, floppy uh, area of a protein can be targeted with an antibody, even though it can't be targeted with a small molecule, a pharmaceutical prep. Um, so we have tried to harness this idea to develop vaccines and therapeutics uh, for um, for prion diseases, for uh, the transmissible prion disease, chronic wasting disease. There's a vaccine under field trials by a Canadian um, vaccine consortium called PREVENT. Um, there's a, um, a program at uh, the company I started called Amorphix Life Sciences that's specifically targeting cancer cells and not normal cells. Uh, you heard about an anti-oligomer immunotherapy, which is under development by uh, CanGene and Emergent for Alzheimer's disease, and finally a uh, therapeutic for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis directed against misfolded superoxide dismutase 1, sparing normally folded SOD1. So these uh, these approaches uh, may have efficacy because they're specifically targeting a pathogenic species, neutralizing toxicity, blockade of propagation, and they have theoretical safety because they're sparing of normal proteins, which would preserve the normal function and minimize autoimmunity. So to make this um, as simple as I can, so, it so even I can appreciate it, propagated protein misfolding is, uh, we can see one uh, protein, one example of a protein becoming misfolded in the cell on the left. It uh, confers its misfold to the other proteins in the cell. It is transmitted across the intracellular space and can induce misfolding in the recipient cell, and both cells die. What if we have a, um, the same process beginning in the left-hand cell, convincing its fellows to adopt the abnormal toxic shape, and when the bad protein moves into the interstitial space, we have an antibody or a vaccine uh, that is um, blocking the transmission from cell to cell, and the end result is that the uh, cell on the right is actually protected. Uh, this idea is finding application in Alzheimer's disease, in Parkinson's disease, and in ALS. So this is, um, this is a concept whose time has come. So I told you I would briefly discuss PreonNet Canada. It was a seven-year, $35 million investment by the federal government in socioeconomic innovation. Uh, we were able to take uh, Canada from a country with three, uh, maybe four Prion experts, if you're generous, and turn it into a country with 120 uh, Prion experts. We trained a number of highly qualified personnel, uh, people going on into uh, industry, academia, uh, policy, um, uh, policy work. We networked 15 Canadian institutions, 25 international collaborators, and uh, 60 partners in North America, Europe, and in Asia. Uh, 
Um, so we uh, made tremendous progress in understanding the basic science of prion disease, uh, of uh, recognizing and being able to uh, prevent prion disease in the wild, including chronic wasting disease, and also um, risk management of prion diseases in the hospital uh, and uh, in the community and on the farm and uh, in, uh, in the wild. So I, I just want to reiterate that this idea of propagated protein misfolding uh, has uh, all emerged from careful and extended contemplation of the prion hypothesis. Uh, it is now uh, thought to participate in Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, ALS, but there's a whole universe of prion-like diseases which are being elucidated at this very moment. Huntington's disease has a prion-like component. Amyloid neuropathy has a prion-like component. Type 2 diabetes has a prion-like component. And even schizophrenia has been found to, um, to uh, include a misfolded protein which can transfer from cell to cell. It's ultimately possible that we can develop effective therapeutics and preventative measures for all of these diseases and many others if we are able to seize this opportunity. So um, KT and KM in my lab, I just want to summarize this and put it in the uh, context of Elisa's presentation. Uh, we have created new knowledge. We've made discoveries in the field of neurodegeneration, uh, which is through a basic understanding of protein misfolding to develop new therapeutics, diagnostics, and preventative vaccines. We have collaborated with various stakeholders, including through the Prionet partners, patient groups, biotechnology, and pharma companies to move these results into practice. We have consulted uh, and learned from that consultation and uh, been able to uh, effectively transfer uh, knowledge into these receptors. Um, we have worked with knowledge users, including clinicians, uh, patient groups, health charity organizations, and the private sector to develop and translate therapies that prevent and treat neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, as was uh, discussed before, we've also taken end-of-grant KT uh, into practice by disseminating our research uh, findings in scientific journals including open access journals uh, such as the PLOS journals and uh, PNAS. Uh, we've successfully commercialized immunotherapies for ALS and Alzheimer's disease uh, through Amorphix Life Sciences, Biogen IDEC, and CanGene Emergent uh, Corporation. So this is a picture of my lab, of course, uh, with the old guy in the middle and the young, enthusiastic, um, uh, hard-working um, uh, people around me who are, who are actually doing the work with their hands. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, CIHR. Actually, I've received grants from three of the institutes, Immunology, Aging, and uh, Neuroscience and Mental Health. Uh, I was also funded by Prionet Canada. I'm funded by a new organization called Brain Canada, ALS Canada, and I have support from Canada Research Chairs. I uh, have active collaborations not only within University of British Columbia, but University of Toronto, University of Alberta, University of Saskatchewan, and the three companies that have supported uh, many of these uh, successful translation of uh, bench science into uh, actual society, uh, Biogen, Amorphix, and Emergent Biosolutions. So I thank you for your attention. It's much appreciated. Well, well thank you, Dr. Cashman. Fascinating uh, presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank everyone for participating in today's webcast. We hope that you found today's session to be informative 
And as a reminder, the webcast will be archived on the KTDRR's website at www.ktdrr.org. We have a brief evaluation form and would appreciate your input about this webcast. The link is on the last page of the presentation file. And everyone who registered will also get an email with the link to the evaluation form. Once again, a big thank you from the staff at the Center of KTDRR to our presenters, Dr. Alyssa Schaefer and Dr. Neil Cashman. We also appreciate the support from NIDER to carry out this webcast and other center activities. On this final note, I will conclude today's webcast and invite you to participate in the others from this series. Thank you. <laughs>